All right, as everyone comes in, welcome everyone to Ben's Book Club. Um, we'll just wait for everyone. Jack, uh, we've just been talking about a brilliant new book by a new author in Australian fiction. Can you can you tell me the title again? Because it was really, really good. I sure can. It's interesting because you asked me what the author's name was, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I couldn't remember, but <laughs> there was no risk of forgetting the title because it was The Hit Woman's Guide to Reducing Household Debt. <laughs> It's so good. The Hit Woman's Guide to Reducing Household Debt. I love it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I I loved it from before the first page because I thought that's such a good title that I'm not going to be able to not read that. So when the author was like, oh, thanks so much for agreeing to read an advanced copy. I'm like, look, I was going to buy this anyway. So if it <laughs> just save me 30 bucks. <laughs> it does. It sounds like it's in your wheelhouse, like firmly. It sounds comedic and dark from that title. Yeah, I I have this um, long-standing opinion that uh, darkness and comedy or noir and comedy, uh, I don't know. Well, the point is you can only get away with one if you also have the other. So yeah. if you're yeah. interested in sort of plumbing the really shocking depths of human violence, then you also need to have a really good sense of humour. And that um, that title does both already. So well done yeah. to uh, yeah. Mark. You hooked. You hooked from the title. I mean, it's hard to do. So, it's a debut novelist coming with that um, later this year. Is that right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, sending out it, the book is so polished and that it really, must be really, really close to to coming out. So, except ARCs haven't even gone out yet. I've I'm reading like a Word doc. So maybe oh, like six months away. Super advanced copy. Wow. Um, yeah, you've, some people, Mandy and Christine, thank you. People, um, as we arrive, um, just type where you're from in the chat. We've got Jack Heath here. Um, Jack Heath, we're all familiar with Jack. He's returning guest to Ben's Book Club. He is the award-winning author of more than 40 books, which I still, that number still, I don't know how, that it, it both angers me and makes me happy. Um, I wish I had written 40 books, but it makes me happy that you've written 40 books because you're a very excellent writer. Um, he wrote his first novel in high school and sold it to a publisher at 18, which is extremely exciting. And then uh, 2018, he sort of moved into writing crime for adults with Hangman. And then he's got all that series. We interviewed Jack about Headcase, um, which Timothy um, Blake loved it, loved getting into that world. And then we've got Kill Your Brother and now this one, which was shortlisted for a Ned Kelly Award. Tonight we're talking to Jack about Kill Your Husbands, which I loved. Um, but everyone is in the chat typing where they've come from. If you're new to Ben's Book Club, this is a bit of a tradition. Jack, can you see the participants, the chat? Yep, yep, I definitely can. They're, they're Look at all these people tuning in. To respond to everyone. But it's places, wonderful. Yeah. It's awesome that so many people have tuned in to um, to say hello. I really appreciate that. It, it's lovely, hey, and I love I love that we get to be a group of people all together, but from all these different locations. There's a few from Brisbane, Penny. Uh, who else was from Brisbane? Stephen, how did you guys go yesterday with the heat? Because we had our power turn off because of all the air conditioners running in in oh, Brisbane. Fine the power shut off where I'm at. So from about six to nine o'clock, we were out on the front trying to catch a breeze. It was full on. Where are you Where are you from, Jack? Can we ask that? And how's the heat been going with you? Yeah, I am from Canberra, where it has been uncharacteristically hot. I think of Canberra as a, a pretty nice city for indoorsy type people who like reading books because in <laughs> summer, it's typically too hot to go out. In winter, it's too cold. In spring, it's wet. And also there's the magpies. <laughs> So you've, you've really only got autumn to kind of emerge and enjoy some of the weather, but it's just around the corner. I am looking forward to it. <laughs> Can um, I just my... quickly circle back and say that the author of The Hit Woman's Guide to Reducing Household Debt is Mark Mupotza Russell. Um, so that's a, a name, a debut author, Australian. So that's a name to, to look out for later this year. I'm so I excited. I would love about this. to have that book on this club. If we can get him on here, I would really love that too. So I'll put in a good word for you. Please. Thank you. Um, Debbie from Brisbane, first time tuning in. Thank you, Debbie. Sunshine Coast, Coffs Harbour, Gosford. Oh, from Tasmania. I'm coming down there soon for a holiday. I can't wait to get into that. I'm coming in July, so super cold Tasmania. I can't wait in this heat. I'm looking forward to that. This is amazing. Um, I very vividly remember doing a book 
launch in Brisbane that only six people turned up to. It's so cool to have like <laughs> hundreds of people from all around Australia tuning into this. Isn't it fun? Yeah. Um, Angeline, I'm also a high school teacher um, and I had a class today in Brisbane that air, air con stuffed up. So yeah, it was a literature class. It was full on, very difficult. Judy, oh no, Judy still got her troubles with the with the trouble with logging in. Judy's been trying to log into book club for a while. I hope it works out, Judy. Um, but let's move forward. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm just in the chat right now, typing in our Facebook group, Ben's Book Club. Um, so you're welcome to come and join us. It is a free group, obviously, and you can come along and talk about all the books we've got coming up. And there's been some people talking about this book. Very excited for our chat tonight, Jack. So it's pretty exciting that you're here. Um, but I wanted to start with this question, Jack. I am a husband. Okay, see? Why why do you want people to kill me, Jack? What happened? <laughs> I uh, I don't want people to kill their husbands, for the record. I'm happy to <laughs> go on the record as saying, you know, murder bad. Like mm. that's my my policy is against it. But yeah. Put that is, quote on the cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. That that can be my Your Honor. <laughs> I said on the cover, you know, a, a work of fiction or whatever. But it <laughs> is um I think that the older I get and the further I get into my writing career, the more sort of instinctive I become or uh, actually maybe that's not quite right. Maybe I've always been instinctive, but I guess I'm slowly figuring out over the course of my life as a reader and a writer what I like and what I don't. And it doesn't really matter, I think, why I like it. It just matters that I do. And so if mm. a, a book um, called Kill Your Husbands, I'm like, yeah, I'd read that. That feels good. Whereas if it was called Kill Your Wives, I would not pick up that book. I just wouldn't want it. So <laughs> yeah. even with the title, I'm just kind of going with my gut, but trying to consider all the options and then just going for the one that feels right. I don't know why, you know, violence against men is sort of elicits a sort of wicked grin from me and my <laughs> readers versus violence against women, but it doesn't matter. Oh, you know, it does I actually gave, I had, I actually received two copies of your book, Jack, and I gave it to, I gave one of the copies to a friend from work who went through a really bad divorce. And as soon as she got the book, she was like, oh yes, I really want to read this. So um, it was pretty, it was pretty fun. Um, happy anniversary, um, Gordana. Thank you for being a part of Ben's Book Club for one whole year. That's incredible. Thank you for coming. Um, and I hope your writing's going well, by the way, as well. Um, what we normally do with book club, this is an invitation to all of you in chat to actually talk to Jack as well. So if you ever have a question for him, this is a really chilled out session, please type it into chat. If you've enjoyed his works or have any questions for him at all, this is our opportunity to come in and meet with Jack. Um, I'm actually interested in this idea of you approaching things instinctually because you've written 40 books now. Do you think that you have sort of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Programmed your instincts to or fine tuned your instincts to actually find the things that appeal to a reader. Because because I just find it very interesting. This is such an awesome title, and you are extremely good at titles. But when I come up with titles, it always feels very difficult to find the right thing. But you just sort of get there with your gut. I love this idea. Teach me your ways. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure you can find a better teacher than me regarding titles. I remember <laughs> my, my first book, when I started writing it, it was called Six of Hearts, and then it went through a range of other titles, and eventually the, um, the publisher decided to call it The Lab. And then my second book was called Plan B, and then a few other things, and the publisher eventually stamped remote control on it. And I remember writing this other book where a friend of mine said, what's your new book called? And I said, oh, I don't know, I haven't given it a title because the publisher always changes it. And my friend said, how about third transmission? And I said, dude, I have not even told you what the book is about or anything about it. And he's like, yeah, but don't you think that sounds cool, third transmission? And so <laughs> I put that in the manuscript and then the publisher was like, brilliant title this time, Jack. Usually your titles aren't very good, but this time you really nailed it. And so that's what they went with. And I realized that my friend 
who knew nothing about the book was actually in a great position because the readers don't know anything about the book either when they first come across the title. Mm, so that's interesting. You kind of need to be able to think your way into that head. Whereas I was always gravitating towards titles that had some kind of double or tri triple or quadruple meaning or something that was, you know, a really clever summary of the theme. But when yeah. you first hear it, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything. It, it d just kind of doesn't sink in. It's not something like the hit woman's guide to reducing household debt. Yeah. So, but in this case, when when I came up with the plot for Kill Your Brother, um, I, as soon as that line of dialogue, like the the villain saying you have to kill your brother, that I was like, oh, okay. So I keep my eye out for good titles when I'm reading the manuscript, just kind of memorable lines. And right. in this case, in the case of Kill Your Husbands, um, originally it was called Kill Your Husband. And then um, my publisher pointed out that the cop actually finds two dead men at the beginning rather than mm. just one. So we need to make it the plural. And then my agent said, um, oh, it has kind of an, an air, a, a frisson of feminist rage as well, doesn't it? Like burn your bras, kill your husbands. And I was like, wow, that line's going in the book. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so agent gave I, that line. I, I can't help you. All I know is like every other bit of writing, it takes a lot of attempts to get it right. It's funny. It's funny too, because you're right. Like kill your husband versus kill your husbands it is a little bit more intriguing like i when i read that title it makes me want to read the book just to see how you pull the title off like mm. it's like a it's like a trick i'm like how's he gonna do this what is this going to be about how is she gonna have multiple husbands it's gonna be a history of this serial i'm really interested from the jump um which you want in a reader right you want them coming to the page prepped and ready to go with that sort of thing yeah, I think with with a title, you've got to do a couple of things. First and foremost, you've got to grab the reader's attention, but mm. it's got to be the right reader. It's got to be the the reader who would actually enjoy the content of the book. Like there's there's no point writing a book called you know sex and violence, and then you know the the actual book is like very conservative Christian fiction or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really need it to. So in this case, I was like, well the. The title, it's kind of, it, it's provocative, but it's also a little bit funny. It definitely implies murder, and this is a crime fiction novel, um, but it's also a novel that's kind of, uh, if, if it's not too pretentious to say this, it's a novel that's fairly concerned with gender as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, it just felt like the right combination of those three words to try and to sort of hook the exact reader who would enjoy it most. Yeah, I, yeah, I think you nailed it, man, and I think you do nail it very regularly um we're getting lots of questions in chat this is actually a little unprecedented jack um i'd like to go through a couple if that's okay um yeah and let, and let other people do my job for me which is wonderful um thank you guys sharon uh s has said pitching for a movie this sounds like a movie is this going to be a movie oh look at the face I, jack tell I, us about it no i can't talk about it it's oh. at that i oh. can't talk about it stage so um Darren, watch this space you, you sharon can, you, you can hear behind what jack's saying there right <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting man i'm happy to hear that though i didn't hear anything no obviously. none of us did yeah. none of us heard a single thing at all hmm. um paula milo is asking jack how long did it take to actually write the book so give us a bit of a snapshot into your writing process man what is it like to have the idea, get the manuscript yeah. editing, yeah. I know that I was, um, basically, when I look at how long I'm going to need to write a project, um, hang on, I'm going to do something a little bit risky and, like, bring up one of my emails on the screen so I can, like, share it with you. Is that going to be okay? Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Would love to see no, you. Right. Well, it, it's just, like, a, a neat summary of, of the answer to this question but only if I can, uh, only if I can actually find it. Because the the gist of all this stuff is that I know that this book is like seventy five thousand words long, around about that. So yes. that means that I know it took around about. So I write about fourteen hundred words a day, and I do that five days a week, which equals seven k per week. So a seventy five thousand word book is going to take me about seventy five days to write. But then when it comes to the um, reading 
uh, sorry, not the reading, like the structural edit will take half yeah. as long as that. And then the copy edit will take half as long again. And then the um, the the one after that, oh man, I can't find this email. I'm, I'm sorry, okay. I feel like I've really over-promised and under-delivered. <laughs> Maybe I archived it or something. It is a bit oh, unprecedented. I know what to Google. Uh, sheer drop, which is, what do you think of sheer drop as a title, by the way? Would you read that? For this? Yeah. Oh, no, no, not for this, for like a future book that you know nothing about, but I know quite a lot about. I think Sheer Drop is pretty darn good. I don't, I'm being honest. No, I quite like Sheer Drop. Yeah. Okay. It sounds, it sounds like it's going to be about mountain climbing or someone's falling off a cliff or something. Yeah. Right. Okay. So is that what, the, is that what it is? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have like, I have a, a first scene, but I, I don't really have a setting. But it definitely, I feel, again, it's about appealing to a certain kind of reader. Like if, mm. if it would be a drop on the cover and then there isn't a cliff, um, then they, and maybe winemaking? <laughs> I don't know. What? <laughs> Something like okay, that. Well, now I'm really but, interested in yeah, anyway, that. Yeah, anyway, so I have a whole bunch of projects on the go. But so you asked how long it took to write this. Call it 75 days for the first draft and then half as much again for the structural, half as much again for the copy edit, half as much again for the proofread, half as much again for the final pass. So 75 times two is 150. We're talking about 150 days. But I've noticed this thing where, um, and that would have been split over the course of about a year because yeah. when I send it off to the publisher, I need to wait for their notes and yeah. in that time I'm always working on another project so um, my life is confusing the thing I was trying to show you was like the list of all the projects and how long I had to go on each one and when I would be able to submit this or that but yeah. I've been thinking lately about how a lot of writers and artists more broadly in 2020 they um, they did some of their best work like I'm thinking of um, Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone by Ben Stevenson. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of Folklore by Taylor Swift. I'm thinking of all these like great artists who suddenly had a bunch of spare time, but also mm -hmm. a whole heap of fear and uncertainty that encouraged them to be a bit more daring than they otherwise yeah, would have. Yeah. And Risk it I all reckon, sort of thing. I reckon this was probably my 2020 book in terms of the outlining. Like that, that was the... Know. I was I was working out the plot in lockdown and I think the the story is better for it. There were no, wow. nothing to distract me for better or worse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I've got some quotes I'm going to read in a second about the structure. Um, um Sorry, it just the chat's got such great questions. I'm sort of toying with where we go from here. Does, um, yeah. I will I will actually ask these. I've got some what I did was I went on the internet and I found some quotes from some people who have uh, loved your book, uh, but I'll read a couple of these to you, but it does sort of talk about the structure. Um, so um, Andrea said this, author Jack Heath has obviously had a lot of fun writing this follow-up to Kill Your Brother, and that translates to a clever, sly, twisty murder mystery thriller. Uh, Marianne said Heath uses multiple narrators to tell a tale that is cleverly plotted with twists that might require pre-booking a chiropractic appointment, which I thought that was a brilliant turn of phrase from Marianne. Well-disguised clues and red herrings to keep even the most astute reader guessing right up to the exciting climax. And oh. then uh, Aaron from the Ben's Book Club Facebook group said, finish this last night um, after really wanting to the night before, but my eyes didn't allow it. <laughs> so you had, you had her hooked, which is great. Um, fantastic read, creepy enough but twisty that picking the villain was actually really tricky. So a lot of people here talking about the twists, the turns, you flash back to different characters, but in the present tense or investigating, it's really structurally interesting, Jack. And I'd love for you to sort of talk about how you came to write this, like you just said, this, I feel like a difficult novel to pull off, which you really did. So can you talk us through it, man? Yeah, I uh, I sure can. So the the genesis of this was that it started kind of in um, 2013. We were at the height of like Fifty Shades of Grey mania. I don't know if you recall that. And I, I was um, I was trying to work out. So and at the time, so 
Fifty Shades of Grey was selling millions of books. I was a published author who was also like working part-time at the good guys selling televisions. And I was like, how do I get in on that action? Like the, the book sales action, not the um, spanking. And I was like, well, so I started kind of mapping out like a romance novel. And it was really more like a diagram than an outline. It was like sort of man A is fixated on woman B, but woman B is married to man C, blah, 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 blah. The, Jack, the premise... Jack, so Jack, can I, sorry, I need to interrupt very quickly. I'm sorry, yeah. mate. Um, I've just had multiple people in the chat. I can't see if you can see it, but they're pl saying, please don't spoil it too heavily because they haven't finished it yet and they're really hooked. So <laughs> just as you're yeah, going through okay. this... Thanks, mate. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt I'm, you. I'm not going to spoil either Kill Your Husbands or Fifty Shades of Grey. I, um... <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Appreciate, <laughs> yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> so, but because my idea was for a book about a partner swap where, um, and it was going to be romance, so there would be sex. This was going to be like a sexual experiment, but it was going to lead to a husband and wife whose marriage was sort of falling apart rediscovering their love for one another by discovering that their the relationships they'd always kind of imagined and pined for with other with their friends spouses weren't all they were cracked up to be and meanwhile yeah. there was going to be another couple who made the partner swap permanent because they realized they should have been together all along blah 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 everyone uh, has yeah, their yeah. Arc. but the thing is writing romance books is A, really difficult, and B, not what people pick up a Jack Heath book for. <laughs> they don't <laughs> want that. So yeah. I kind of shelved this idea. But it was years later when um, I thought, oh, but if one of them was secretly murdering all the others, like I'd always, always, always wanted to write one of those characters get picked off one by one type um, type stories. There was one I, I just adored when I was a kid called... Class Trip by Bebe Fast Rice. It was one of the point crime books. And okay. I read it over and over because it was so cleverly structured and cleverly plotted. So I really wanted to write a book like that. Um, but in terms of the, the plotting, how did all that work? Um, I really set it up like a game of Cluedo. I was like, okay, I need six characters. Let's name them sort of arbitrarily. I need six occupations for them. So they can be a stand-up comedian, a finance bro, a gym owner, a real estate agent. And then I need six motives for murder because one isn't going to suffice because the reader needs to kind of suspect all of them. Yeah, And... Yeah then, you know, I need different rooms, I need different weapons. And, and then I, I sort of just picked the most interesting combination of, you know, it was wow. blah with the blah in the blah. And that's my <laughs> lack of spoilers there. Um, that's so, so yeah, funny. It's very methodical. Yeah, wow. So you literally mapped it out like that. That's incredible. And it came together so well. Like it doesn't, I feel like sometimes with certain books, you can feel strings being pulled to sort of make the plot happen. But it feels very character based and instinctual with your characters. It doesn't feel like you're forcing anything. Um, mm. So that's quite a magic trick, man, that you've pulled off there. Uh, thank you. I think it really helps to kind of know what each character wants from the beginning. Like you don't have to read, you don't have to tell the reader, um, but you have to know. So it's not just a matter about of knowing the ending and working towards it. It's a, a matter of knowing what thing each character is hiding and what their goals and desires are. And someone asked in the chat, like, did I overwrite or underwrite my first draft? And the answer is probably both. I mean, there are a lot of things I added later and a lot of things I took out later. But in terms of character motivation, I found it really handy to overwrite that first draft because mm -hmm. they say that the first draft is you kind of telling the story to yourself. Um, so I was like, okay, let's pour out all these characters' deepest, darkest secrets onto the page right at the beginning and then prune away the moments where you can keep the reader in suspense about that thing. So the reader can still feel that the character wants something. Um, but, yeah, I found that the more the more layers there are underneath the surface, the more the reader is convinced by the character. And with a story that's kind of unbelievable like this, that's actually more important than ever. Like if you don't buy the characters, you're not going to buy any of it. Mm, that's really clever, man. That's the, um, that's the old iceberg theory of Hemingway, right? You've got just what's happening in the book, but all these things underneath it that you've invested time into that are motivating, motivating that character, but just the surface is what we see. Um, and we feel everything underneath the iceberg. That's really cool, man. I like that. 
Um, uh, Laura McDonald has asked this question, which I really like. Jack, did you have a favorite character from this book or did you have a least favorite character? Can you talk to us about that? Because I think that's really cool. Um, my favorite and least favorite character is probably Oscar because he's the most autobiographical of the bunch. Mm. I think when I, after I sort of wrote out this plot and realized that even though it begins with a cop going into the building and finding two dead men and then one woman holding a man at knife point. So the reader knows what's coming. But then after that, there's a lot of place setting. Um, yeah. So I was like, okay, the first murder isn't actually going to happen until halfway through the book. How am I going to keep the reader engaged and interested and entertained um, for that first half where there's not allowed to be any killing. So I was like, well, I'll channel my inner Holly Wainwright. I love Holly Wainwright. And there's sort of the, the depths that she goes into these characters and their relationships and the, the particular pressure points that they have. But yeah. as I was writing it, I realized that I was going to have to, I realized I was deriving quite a lot from my own life. I said to my wife, I was like, look, People are going to read this and think that it's us, and some of it is. So how are we going to handle that? And mm. my wife, to her credit, she's a brave woman. She's like, babe, just your books are best when you are having fun and speaking your truth and doing whatever you want. So we'll worry about that later. For now, mm. just don't think about what anyone, don't think about what I'm going to think, don't think about what anyone's going to think, just write the book you want to write, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And so after I had her permission, I was kind of a much more freeing, and she read it a chapter at a time as I was going. Um, but later, when the structural editor uh, who wasn't known to me personally. Like we'd worked together before, but we'd never met. She knew nothing yeah. about me or my life as far as I know. Um, she had a section in her structural report where she said, on several occasions, I paused to marvel at what a truly unsympathetic character you'd created here with Oscar. Um, honestly, I might have been taken in by him if I weren't privy to the constant whining and self-pity of his inner monologue. <laughs> and I was like, Yep, completely from my imagination. Change of topic, please. <laughs> it is weird how many people have come up to me since the book came out. And um, <clears throat> often men, actually, and like yeah. talked about how much of themselves they see in Oscar, yeah. whereas women tend to come up and tell me how much they hate Oscar. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's it's been he's so he's the favorite and least favorite character not just but for me but for everyone apparently for for the readers too he was certainly fun to write though I think well I think you I think you're giving voice to something that a lot of men feel I think that I think that a lot of men can feel sometimes pushed to the corners and maybe forgotten by by their families uh, or taken for granted and I know that's not true but it's the feeling and the feeling you can your feelings can kind of run away with you and I think that's what Oscar does right he sort of he gets into his head that this is the way it is when the truth is actually something completely different and it's yeah. the uncovering of that right yeah I I didn't use the the term postpartum depression in the book because um that would just like open a whole can of worms but that's that's definitely what I had, and it's definitely what informed some of Oscar's uh, warped thoughts around yeah. what's happening in his relationship. But I think um, whenever you find something that a lot of people have experienced but no one is comfortable talking about, you often have really good material for fiction. Like yes. after I, it was only after I started writing about this that I discovered there were so many of my friends um, so mostly men, but not all, who had been in the position where they'd had a child, um, it was so much harder than they expected it to be, or actually probably more accurately, um, they thought they would have these. So it was yeah. as hard as they thought it would be, but they had expected themselves to be able to rise to the challenge and they weren't, mm. they were flailing. And then their partner announces that they want a second child and there's this kind of whiplash of the initial person who realizes wait hang on I thought we were both struggling but it's just me and so 
I um, um, I thought we were both in hell, but it turns out it, I'm alone in hell. <laughs> yeah. And I think, so it's, that's not just Oscar, right? That's a lot of people, but for yeah. who understandably, they don't want to talk about, they can't talk about it with their partners. They don't want to admit it to their friends because it makes them feel like a bad parent, a bad spouse, all this yes. stuff. So I think that's what makes Oscar feel so real. The fact that it's something that so many people have experienced, but very few are willing to talk about. And that's kind of one of the reasons we had fiction in the first place. Yeah. And um, I really love what Mary has said here to um, Mary sympathizing with Oscar. But then when he then turns those feelings and starts to obsess with Felicity, he actually becomes less sympathetic. But she says here, layered characters are great. And I would say, I would add to that, layered characters feel the most realistic to me because we're mm -hmm. complicated and complex and not always pretty, right? So I kind of, yeah, I agree with her. I think he made Oscar and all the characters extremely three-dimensional. Um, are we able, if it's okay with you, to go back to talking about some of your editing stuff? Yeah, I'd sure. really love to chat to you a bit more about your writing routine. So we had a bit of a chat about producing the words and then getting the structural edits and all those sorts of things. But what's it like to get those notes? Like what sort of notes were given for this book? Yeah. Was it character stuff? Was it structural? Like how does that stuff work for you? Um, I think the biggest, so yes, there was, there was character stuff. There was stu structural stuff. There was setting stuff. There was all, all sorts of things. Um, I think, I probably got the least notes on the plot, which is probably because the the plot was the bit that I kind of had nailed down before I even started writing. Everything else was just designed to scaffold it. So, um, but making some of the, making the central premise convincing mm. was probably the hardest bit. Like, um, uh, so for example, there was a lot of feedback on an early draft. It was like, okay, the idea that these people would not recognize one another just because it was dark um in the like the idea that you might not know who you are having sex with which is central to the premise of the book like that's not yep. a twist that's the whole reason that they do this partner swap in the dark right is is the the um flimsy idea that it might not be awkward if you don't really know for sure um who it happened with and so but uh, I was like, okay, so I knew in advance that that was going to be a bit unbelievable. But I was like, okay, so what are what are going to be the challenges to the reader accepting that? And yeah. so, okay, people have different body types, but if they were if they all went they all went to high school together, so they're all about the same age. Um, and if they were all on the athletics team together, that implies, mm. you know nice sort of body shape um and then that gives me an excuse to bring elise into the action as well because she's a former athlete so that that's a flimsy pretext but it's a a reason that sort of she could understand yes. a bit better and yep. okay they're not allowed to talk in the dark um they all the sort of one of the men has to shave off his beard i did all this work to to try to make that believable um but also i had to kind of hang a lantern on it is is the expression where yeah, like yeah. there's at least one of the characters who's like do these people all seriously think that they're not going to know who they had sex with and then so at least the reader feels like their concerns have been acknowledged <laughs> yeah and yeah. then that character can be like oh wait they're each 100 percent sure that they will know they just want to be able to pretend that they don't but then in the end, they're actually not sure. Um, so then I had to kind of emphasize the chaos of the house. So the biggest, um, those structural edits, copy edits, proofreads, every stage of the manuscript, um, there was more work to do on that, on just making that central conceit believable. And mm. to be honest, your mileage may vary. Like there have been some glowing reviews of this book, but there have also been some very negative ones. And oh. most of the negative ones are like, as if this could happen. <laughs> so okay, yeah, for yeah. some readers, I didn't quite go far enough in terms of making it plausible. But yeah, that was the, the biggest kind of note. Mm, okay, okay. Well, that's fair. Um, yeah, I love I love that insider trading stuff about hang a lantern on it, right? That's about, that's about prep, pre-thinking about what questions the audience will have and then answering those questions via the characters in the text, right? 
Yeah. But this is a bit unbelievable, but just go with it sort of thing. Yeah, but I know this is a cliche, but I think it's a good idea to see the problems as opportunities, right? Like whenever yeah, yeah. whenever you come across a plot hole um, and you find yourself thinking, you know, why on earth would such and such do that? Then it's your job as the author to think, why indeed? And like <laughs> consider that as an opportunity to like develop that character a bit more or or turn turn the plot hole into a twist, you know, that kind of thing. There was um, there was this instance where I've recently watched or rewatched the whole um, series of Lost, the TV show with my kids. Oh, I was going to bring up Damon Lindelof before when you were talking about um, uh, Hemingway and the iceberg theory. Damon Lindelof says that every character needs a secret, and it's oh. it's so true. It's, it and is. If you watch Lost, you can see it. Like he's given every single character a secret, and you may not even mind. find out what it is. But it infuses everything they say with a layer of meaning that just makes you lean in. Yes, yes. Well, that's he's the guy I actually learnt that phrase, hang a lantern on it, because oh, okay. there are so many things that happen that are unbelievable in Lost. And I remember clocking this one scene where Sawyer is walking along. Um, spoiler alert for Lost season six, I guess. He's walking along and someone says to him, oh, geez, this is a bit unbelievable, isn't this? How this is all happening coincidentally. And he turns around and goes, what unbelievable, like John Locke walking again after he died. And the mm-hmm. other guy's like, oh, yeah, good point. That is unbelievable. So he w- they hung a lantern on it. You know what I mean? Like pointed it out, but then answered it with Sawyer just sort of flipping it off a bit. I love that stuff. It's- yeah. I uh, sometimes, like, I try not to address the reader directly too much because you never want to remind them that they're being told a story. You want them to to just sort of immerse themselves in it completely. But Unless I couldn't. Ben res- Stevenson does that, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, ben right. <laughs> well, he actually, um, again, that's sort of the the creativity madness of 2020. He's like, what if I constantly did that? <laughs> you know desensitized to it and still enjoyed the story solari yeah. gentile's great at that as well um mm. book the woman in the library but i couldn't resist one opportunity in kill your husbands when the cop is reflecting on how unlikable characters in crime fiction are like truly awful people like drug dealers and cannibals so that's me kind of hanging a lantern on a, a floor in one of my other books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if that is allowed. Um, can I just quickly say, these aren't strictly questions, but um, things in the chat, the people who are saying they don't like uh, Dom uh, and some people saying they don't like Felicity, I see you. <laughs> I hate those people. <laughs> it's uh, not Dom and Felicity specifically, but that kind of person <laughs> I find very difficult to tolerate. Yeah. Did you... Did you um... Did you have fun writing them at least though, like in a like in a way, you know, to exercise that stuff? Oh, for sure I did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, h- half the reason we do this job, I reckon, well, I, I suppose I, I shouldn't speak for all authors. I, I shouldn't speak for you, but um, it's because you kind of, uh, you know, when you're a kid and you're like, hmm, what am I going to be when I grow up? And you kind of cycle through all these options and then eventually land on one and probably just one. And you can kind of feel those other things you might have been um, mm. hovering as potential regrets um, on the side of your consciousness. Mm. Authors don't need to have those regrets because you get to be all those things that you might have been just via the characters. <laughs> yeah. So there is no reason, for example, um, structurally to have Felicity, the stand-up comedian, do a stand-up comedy routine early on the only reason that is there is because i wanted to imagine being a stand-up comedian and what routine i would do so (laughs) that was just kind of me experimenting with um the road not taken you know and Mm. so yeah i i did have fun writing those characters even though i don't really like them as people um but i think that road not taken thing kind of sits very naturally with this book because it's all about that. It's all about how we, it's natural to to wonder about the, the other places you might end have ended up, that other person you might have married or that other job that might have made you more money or that, that trip overseas that you never took. Um, it's, but at a certain point you get old enough that you have to accept that you shouldn't try to change it. It's too late. <laughs> if you change it, you end up with two dead husbands and a third one held at knife point. Yeah, yeah. 
Would you, is that what you consider to be a type of midlife crisis as it's called? Would you say that that's what it is? A sort of pining for decisions that have been abdicated previously, perhaps? Yeah, I guess. Like I always, so I dropped out of university and I didn't have too, I didn't think too much of it because I figured I could always go back later. And it was probably a decade after that, I realized that was absolutely not the case. Like, yes, there are such thing as mature age students, but I wasn't going to be one of them. You know, I had, <laughs> I had kids, I had a job, all that stuff. So sometimes there are decisions which you know are momentous at the time and there are other decisions where they only you only realize how momentous they were in retrospect mm. and i think often those retrospective ones it's because it wasn't one big decision it was the aggregate of thousands and thousands of little tiny ones yeah that's interesting um, yeah i i forget the question sorry no, no, I think you answered it. There was a midlife crisis question, but oh, I agree. Right. I think... Yeah, yeah, exactly. The midlife crisis. I read this wonderful book called The Power of Regret by Dan Pink that um, showed that people have all sorts of regrets, but the ones that linger all fall into four categories. And therefore, if you, you can safely disregard certain kinds of preemptive regret, like, um, oh, man, I, I don't... I can't do justice to the book, but seriously, check out the the power of regret by Dan Pink. And yeah. if you can find him interviewed on a podcast, he'll tell you what the four kinds are and give you examples. But it's worth reading the whole book. It was very, very interesting. Okay, it sounds really turning on a light. I'm still within earshot. Oh, okay, <laughs> you're right. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's better. The background there is cool. Like, what is that? It looks oh, really yeah. interesting. So this, um, my wife owns a, a jewellery shop um, in Hall Village and that prior to opening the shop, she's a qualified jeweller, she and I used to share this office here at my house and so she wanted it to look very cool and fancy so she bought this beautiful wallpaper. She used to ask her customers when they came in for consultations to describe what they saw in it and some people saw it as like, you know, constellations and galaxies and other mm. people thought it was, uh, you know, rock pools. Some people thought corroded metal. Anyway, so now I have a really cool office, but I'm all alone in here because <laughs> she, she became so successful she could open her own shop. Okay. Oh, yeah, it does look extremely cool. Um, yeah, just as a note, we're actually... I, Every time this happens, cannot believe we're nearly at the end. We've got about 15 minutes remaining. So if you do have any more questions, um, please feel free to pop them in to the chat. Um, Tracy, I, Tracy Allen, I see from Carpe Librems here. I'm assuming Tracy. Oh, she's great. Hi, Tracy. She's great. Yeah, we love Tracy. I'm assuming you've reviewed um, this book. I bet you it's a cracker. Um, if you're interested, uh, Carpe Librem does some really cool reviews of Australian books and authors. So please check out her blog. Um, do you want to type it in the chat, Tracy? I'm giving you a, you can, absolutely, um, type it into the chat. But if you're interested in reading some really great reviews, she's an Australian um, reviewer, really cool. Um, um, by the way, I just deleted a comment with a spoiler in it, but I want it from Christina, but I wanted to acknowledge anyway um, and kind of answer the question, mm -hmm. which was that I felt very strongly that if, at the end of this book, the four relationships in it, so the three couples and then the, the cop and her girlfriend, who we haven't even talked about, um, if all of those relationships ended either via murder or just, you know, um, like the, the people not being able to stand one another, then this book would be irredeemably gloomy. I, um, I needed it to be hopeful and I needed not all the relationships to to mm. end so that was the structural reason i made that controversial choice but it also <laughs> allowed me to um to have the the cop reflect a bit on what people are and are not willing to forgive and mm. why they might or might not be willing to forgive that so um so anyway i um that's why i made that choice there was actually another question earlier on about um kylie and elise and elise is sort of the center of kill your brother is that correct yeah yeah that's right so she's so, th this isn't really a, a a sequel per se um it's just that when i was once i had my plot i wanted i wondered so who should investigate this for a while it was going to be a timothy blake mystery 
And then um, Kill Your Brother went gangbusters. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll reuse the same cop from Kill Your Brother. And then because she was in a relationship with um, Elise, the main character of Kill Your Brother, Elise kind of got dragged into it too. Mm. So um, you don't have to read Kill Your Brother first. uh, But if you have, there'll be a couple of little in-jokes that only you will get. (laughs) <laughs> I love that. Um, thanks, man. Uh, Karen has asked this question, which I love because I'm actually interested too, because I know from your bio that you had your first book uh, bought before you even graduated high school. But uh, can you talk about your path to writing books, please, Jack? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I I always loved reading um, and I always loved writing. So I started telling people that I was going to be a writer from when I was probably, I don't know, 10. But I didn't actually start writing what became my first book until I was 13. And I kind of wanted to impress a girl. <laughs> she really liked reading. I really liked her. So I was like, I'm a writer. And she's like, really, what have you written? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll start today. So I started writing this book, which was kind of a reaction against the book I was being given to read in high school. Like yeah, it was yeah. one of those I could write better than this moments. Like how hard could it be? And it turns what was out. The book? I'm always interested in books we shouldn't have in high schools. Oh, no, no, no. Here's the thing. In retrospect, I think that was probably a really good book. It was so immature that I was like, Uh, this has no helicopters. It has no explosions. There's no Kung Fu. There's no people falling a really, 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 really long way and yet surviving somehow. It's just a girl dealing with her parents' divorce. Who could possibly benefit from reading this? (laughs) (laughs) I started writing my own stupid action adventure book and then I happened to, I I stuck with it is the thing that separated me from all the other would-be writers, I guess. I I knew a lot of other people who were interested in writing, but they they had a lot of first chapters, whereas I, I kept going. Anytime I had a new idea, I worked out a way to fold it into the book I was already writing. And so when... I sent the book off at age 17 to the publisher. Um, This was back, I basically looked along the spines of all my favourite books to see who published them. And I got as far as Ice Station by Matthew Riley and discovered that Pan Macmillan was accepting unsolicited manuscript submissions from authors with no agents, which was basically unheard of elsewhere in the industry. And probably even Pan Macmillan doesn't do it anymore. Um, But So I sent it to them and they liked it. They liked my writing style, but I told them that it was a book for adults because that's what I thought I was writing. I was 17 and I was like, I don't write for children. (laughs) And um, and so then I, I ended up doubling the length to rewrite it as an adult novel. And then they said, actually, it reads more like YA for some reason. They didn't know I was a teenager. I hadn't met them. So they were like, uh, so now it's a bit long for YA. And I ended up trimming it back down. But I think that was the process where um, I would love to pretend that I was some kind of child prodigy, but I wasn't. It's just that at age 17, I had the opportunity to work with like top grade editors on mm. the process, I got. I was doing a structural edit with one of Australia's big four publishers in my late teens. And so that meant that um, now I'm 37 and I have 20 years experience. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my advantage over the competition, right? Yeah. Just the fact that everyone else I know who has been in the industry as long as I have is like significantly older. And yeah, I bet. They, uh, yeah. Um- what was it like when you finally dropped the bombshell on them? Like when they finally met you and there comes this pimply teenager, like, how did that go? (laughs) Yeah. uh, They took me out to lunch and um, I had to ask them what spatchcock was because it was on the menu. (laughs) And then I, I ordered it because I thought like I would impress them by ordering something that, they knew I'd never eaten before just to show mm-hmm. them, you know, bold and stuff. So in ret, I was worried about them, like, not taking me seriously. In retrospect, I think they were probably seeing dollar signs because they knew that, like, I, I would be marketable. Like, the yeah. author writes book isn't a news story, whereas teenager writes book is potentially so yeah, i got to go on today sure. tonight i was on sunrise <laughs> you know i um uh then for a while i was you know recognizable people would, would recognize me on the street and stuff because i'd been interviewed by koshi or <laughs> whoever else I, um, 
Today. I'm just going onto YouTube to type in teenager <laughs> Jack Heath. <laughs> oh interview. yeah, you'll find some some really old. Uh, Is it on really there? Really old stuff. Um, so, but yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that I had that opportunity, um, all those opportunities. I've been writing on it ever since. But I also think it's probably not, um, it's not a healthy thing to have really. When you're in your late teens and you're still trying to work out who you want to be, to have pe everyone tell you that you're already great kind of stunts your personal wow. development. So in retrospect, I was very lucky that in my 20s, my career had a real sag. <laughs> there was a long, 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 long time when no one would publish anything I was writing because my first book had been a smash hit and the 10 books I wrote after that were flops. It wasn't wow. until 300 Minutes of Danger in 2015 went gangbusters that I was like, okay, I've reached this level of success now, but now I don't just feel like I'm entitled to it. Now I know how a how, yeah, how special it. it is and how hard I've got to work to keep it. Um, yeah, that's 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 its own kind of perseverance and resilience. Hey, like a lot of people talk about breaking into the industry takes so long, but that must have been hard too to feel that success and then feel the trough of have not having as much success. That must have been quite difficult, I imagine. And then to rise back up and continue, you know, it must have been a passion. Yeah, it it was a passion, but I uh, I think there was an element of fear involved as well. Like if I, uh, there was that that question of if not this, then what? And I never had a a good answer to that. Like any any other job terrified me. This was something I knew how to do, and possibly the reason I knew how to do it was because you know anything else I did in my life had always. I was kind of too scared to fail, which meant I was too scared to try. Whereas writing was something that I could do on my own in the privacy of my own home. I could do it over and over again until I got it right. I could make it, you know, perfect before I risked anything by yeah. showing it to anyone else. And so then a, a while later, I'm, this isn't a healthy thing, by the way. I'm, this isn't advice. <laughs> it's just how my brain works. I was like, well, but if I if I lose my career with the one skill that I was able to acquire somehow, then, then what even am I? So I kept writing because I felt like I didn't have a choice. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I appreciate you talking so candidly, man. Like, and I hope that, um, who asked that question? That was Karen Spencer asked that question about your path to writing books. Um, yeah, it's so interesting because every, every author we talk to, it's always a different sort of, there's no one right way to do it. It always is ups and downs and perseverance. I guess that's the one thing that keeps coming back is this idea of just being, having a lot of resilience and keep coming back to the page, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. It's interesting, whenever someone thanks me for being so candid, I realize, I should I not have said that? <laughs> like, I don't always <laughs> know how I come across to people. Every now and again, someone says, thanks for your honesty. And I'm like, oh dear, I've said something rude. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, fear not. No, it's just about, I just think that we can get a bit cagey and perhaps, and this, it comes out in your writing too. Like, I think you feel a certain sense of, I think you have a fair sense of confidence in being vulnerable publicly which I think some people can perceive as being weak, but it's not a weakness. It's an invitation for others to feel like they're seen as well and that we all struggle. And it's nice to hear a person who is as accomplished as you went through some tougher things because then our tougher things feel like they're more valid. Does that make sense? I think I actually worded no, that it, pretty good. <laughs> it does make sense. And, but I, I want to say, I think it's, one of the hardest things is the fact that so many people, including me, the only reason I'm willing to be so honest about all my failures is because I've had such success since. Like, it doesn't really yeah. cost me anything to admit um, that, you know, I, I spent most of my 20s in this sort of existential crisis. You know, I had no money and seemingly no future and stuff. But at the time, I would have told everyone that everything was going great. Because <laughs> whereas now, interesting. If, if I point out that, oh, well, things were really tough um, back then. And, and now someone says, well, maybe you just weren't a very good writer. You're a total loser. Then I'd just shrug that off because I'm like, no, I'm not. 
I know that I'm very successful now. Whereas at the time, if someone had said, maybe you're just not a very good writer, then I would have, you know, crumbled. <laughs> so I was yeah. nice to admit. Um, can I very quickly answer some questions that have really quick answers that I just yeah, said? Yeah, absolutely, man. Go ahead. Low on time. Go um, for it. But I wanted to say, so Kathy, yes, your book would be great for your other book club. Uh, <laughs> Andy, how did I write the, the dual timelines? Whenever, so no, I wrote them in the order that they appear in the book because I needed to keep track of what the reader knew at any given time. So that was so important so as I didn't accidentally reveal too early who was who, who dies and all that stuff. I was thinking, okay, what does the reader know about what this character knows about what this other character knows? And that would have been <laughs> possible if I wrote it out of order. Yeah. Ingrid has asked me, do I read murder mysteries? And I get sent a lot of them, but reading them sometimes feels like work. So I mostly read rom-coms. My favourite author is an Australian woman named Jessica Detman. I'll type her name in the chat so you can see her there. Her new book is called... Um, without further ado, and it's like a modern day retelling of Much Ado About Nothing. But she, um, I can't recommend her work to everyone. I, I only know that it suits my tastes so perfectly. Um, oh, another really good uh, rom-com and romance writer more generally is Jodie McAllister, who wrote this wonderful, her 2020 crazy creative project was these three romance novels all set in the same season of a fictitious dating show. And I can't describe how wonderful they were to read. It's just, I, <laughs> they, they were great. So yeah, those those couple of authors really worth checking out. Oh, should I type in the name of the um, that other author whose book yeah. hasn't yet as well, since we're talking Absolutely. about- Absolutely, great idea. Yeah. Um... Sorry, I'm just looking up, I'm just looking up um, Jessica Detman. Yeah, um, very different to what you write, which is so interesting. Well, that's yeah, that's right. Say. I mean, if I'm reading the same kind of stuff that I write, then what happens is either I don't enjoy it because I think I could do this, or I don't enjoy it because I'm I'm enjoying it at one remove. I'm there going kind of like, oh, that's an interesting choice or, ooh, that's clever, as opposed to like really absorbing myself in the story. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. No, 100% understand that. I get sent a lot of crime books as well. And sometimes it's actually Ben's book club. We do, I get sent such different books. Like we often talk to, there's a lot of crime, but we do, we do rom-coms. We've done rom-coms. We've done history. We've done non-fiction about growing grapes after retirement making a winery you know all those sorts of things so um this is one place that i actually like i feel like i'm on a holiday reading <laughs> yeah right um yeah, yeah. someone asked if jessica detman was related to joy detman and the the answer is i don't think so but i feel like i've heard that her father might have been a famous writer but i don't know who um, I'm not sure. I find it hard enough keeping up with new books. I don't read a lot of old ones. I should, but yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and Jody McAllister. Um, I posted the name just up there. Yeah, Jody without an E. Yeah, I can see that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're um they they all get the Jack Heath stamp of approval. Very nice. We like that. That should be a new sticker for books: the Jack Heath stamp of approval. We'll get one of those stickers going out. Um. <laughs> Tell, tell us tell us about, you've got something coming out again in like two weeks. Is that correct? Can you tell us oh, a little yeah. bit about that one, man, as we finish up? Here we go. Um, so Spy Academy, The Peak, is a middle grade novel. So it's for kids age kind of 10 and up. Mm. Basically, there's a kid who foils a robbery at his school kind of inadvertently. But because of his quick thinking, he gets invited to study at a secret school for the world's most dangerous spies. And mm -hmm. so think kind of... Harry Potter meets Alex Ryder, but he works out pretty quick that there's like a traitor at the school um, who has infiltrated it on behalf of the enemy, but it's hard to find a spy at a school for spies. So that's the, the first book of at least a two book series. The other one will come out later in the year. Um, I'm writing a murder mystery set on a cruise ship called um, Choppy Water, which has been a lot of fun. So that's where my head is at at the moment. That's what I'm, what I'm Good writing. Good title. Good, Good title. title like yeah, that one okay that one may not change and i'm also supposed to be writing a doctor who book not sure if i'm supposed to be talking about that yet but 
So maybe you didn't hear anything. Who knows? Whoa. Yeah, they anyway, keep that on the download, maybe. Up, but... I grew up reading novelizations of Doctor Who episodes. So my career has come full circle. Wow, mate. That's massive. We um we'll have you back for that one. That's ins- that's so exciting, man. Well done. Fun. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um I was going to say to you too, that Spy Academy, if you want a Charlie Hobson, my son's stamp of approval for that one, um, I'll, I'll definitely be buying that one and getting him to read it because it sounds extremely up his alley. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I will, um, I can hook you up. My people will call your people. <laughs> Imagine my son having his own stamp he can put on books, man. He'd love it. I should get him writing reviews. Maybe I'll get him reading some uh, Tracy Allen reviews and he can take some notes. Um Jack, thank you so much for being part of today. You are so incredibly generous with everything. Um, Just the way you speak, and I just love reading your stuff. We have to have you back. This needs to become a routine, having Jack on each year so that we can talk about his new books, right? Um, It's um, it's always a treat to chat with you and to have so many wonderful people chiming in in the comments. So, yeah, anytime. Yeah, um, I'll just pop it in really quickly, actually, see if I've still got it on my pace. Yeah, I do. So if you're interested in staying up to date with Ben's Book Club, we've got the next few events coming up. Um, So if you head on to the Facebook group, there is uh, a picture there. You can scan the QR codes and you can sign up for all the different things. But it's really exciting what we have coming up. And next month on the 27th of February, we will be talking to Karen Viggers and she's and her latest book, Sidelines which if I'm honest, I haven't read any of, and I don't know much about, but I did meet Karen. Yeah, I think so. Yes. And I met, I met Karen last year when I was on tour with John Lacey. We had a, we had a dinner in Canberra. She's a Canberrian, Cam, Cam. Canberran. Yep. I got it. Yeah. So I've met Karen and she's lovely. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, It'll be really good. So that's Karen Vigger's sidelines, 27th of Feb, but go onto the Facebook group if you're keen to staying in touch and uh, make sure you log in and check out all the things that are coming up. And uh, yeah. I've also put like a shameless plug in the, uh, in the side because I'm off all social media this year, but I do still have a newsletter. So the, the link is there. Yeah. Jack, Jack was saying earlier that he feels so lonely now that he's deleted all his social media. So you do need to go and hit him up on his website, <laughs> follow him for news. I bet you feel very peaceful, Jack. <laughs> yeah yeah my whole regions of my brain are returning it's an enormous relief oh damn i gotta start doing that i think as well um tracy said can i see it's jackheathwriter.com slash news jack posted it in the chat if i put https in front of it you would be able to see it maybe give it a shot oh so jack yeah. uh yeah i see it's just gone to host and panelists Oh. So yeah, you. I think down. Oh, oh, I've been doing yeah, the okay. same no, thing. Wait, I, I can do that, guys. You, oh, so embarrassing. Now, see, now you've got the Bears yeah. Book Club Facebook. My bad. Sorry, guys. Lucky I did that shameless plug, or, or you would never have realized that um, that yours didn't work either. Yeah. Thanks, guys. That's see the chat's so helpful. They do all the interview questions, <laughs> Fiona. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> Oh, now we feel stupid for you. I can't believe that, you guys. You're going to receive like 96 separate invoices. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for being a part of Ben's Book Club, Jack. And thank you guys in the chat. You guys have been so awesome. And um, look forward to seeing you next time. Now, this was recorded, right? Because I just see Ian Dixon saying he missed the chat because he got no, the time yeah. wrong. Is he going to be able to watch it later? Yeah, Ian. Yeah, Ian. Love you, mate. Sorry that you missed it um ian's from the uk so he's, the time zone stuff is a bit tricky for ian and he still manages to get here sometimes but yes um if you go to youtube and you type in ben's book club libby you should find the playlist but this should be uploaded by the end of the month and you can re-watch everything oh awesome. Brooke, i'm sorry <laughs> we'll, we'll figure everything out short, shortly i'm sure um but thanks again jack and thanks everyone else um Stay tuned for next month and stay tuned for more from Jack Heath throughout the year. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.